Sharing the gospel is nothing new. After all, the gospel message goes back some 2,000 years, and gospel singing, as you will soon learn, goes back even farther than that. Radio is a youngster by comparison. The first radio station in the United States, KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, broadcast first on November 2nd, 1920. Not long after, in January of 1921, they carried a microphone to a local church to broadcast the morning service. As a result, they also carried the first gospel music ever heard on radio in America. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Amy Simple McPherson became perhaps the best-known preacher and gospel singer in the country. Her style of evangelical preaching and singing opened the airwaves for many future preachers and gospel singers to come. But what about modern Southern gospel music? How did it start? How did the need to sell songbooks by the publishers of those books give birth to today's Southern gospel music? Which gospel music composer wrote the campaign song used during Franklin D. Roosevelt's second campaign for President of the United States? What group started the National Quartet Convention almost 50 years ago? And what singer, who later sang backup for Elvis Presley, managed those conventions? You'll get the answers to these and many other questions in this podcast, because in 1990, historian and longtime radio man Phil Womack added yet another title to his resume, that of author, when he published Gospel Trivia, A Guide to Southern Gospel Music. Listen as Phil describes how he came to write this book in the first place, and then shares an excerpt from the book entitled The Gospel Music Story. Radio Remembers Southern Gospel Music In the mid-1980s, I was working at a radio station, WCMA, in Corinth, Mississippi. Two guys that I had known for most of their lives, Gene Sanders and Keith Frazier, came to me and and said that they wanted to start a gospel music program on WCMA once a week at night, an hour-long program. And as I said, I've known both of Keith and Gene for most of their lives, going all the way back to when they were just barely <laughs> big enough to hold a guitar or strum a, a bass fiddle when they were playing in a gospel band, which they were still doing at, the, at this time. I told them, well, sure, guys, I, I'll be glad to help you. Uh, we can call it the Nighttime Gospel Hour, since it's, you want an hour-long program. And they said, well, can you help us get the music together, uh, music to choose from and so forth, records. We were playing still a lot, some CDs at that time. And uh, I said, sure, I'll let you two be the host and I will be the producer. I'll get the the music together for you to choose from. Make sure that you get all the latest uh, albums and singles and whatnot that come out. And then y'all can put it on. And they added a third host, Joey Gilmore. And the three of them did a really good job. And, it, and the Nighttime Gospel Hour was so successful that uh, in less than a year, uh, it went up to two hours. And I said, well, guys, this is great. Now we can promote it as the biggest hour on radio, the Nighttime Gospel Hour, two hours long. And they continued with it. The only problem was they decided to have what they called gospel trivia time. But it wasn't really trivia. It was name that tune. They would put a record on and invite people to call in and tell them the name of the of the song and everything. I said, guys, it's a great idea. I like it. Uh, but if you're going to call it gospel trivia, why not ask trivia questions? To which they responded, sure. You write the questions, we'll ask them. (laughs) Well, that's good, except that, um, you know, it didn't take me too long to realize I was going to run out of questions eventually. I had a fair amount of knowledge of of the groups, knew many of them personally, and um, I could, uh, could throw some questions out there for them and everything. But I started then looking for what I've expected to find very easily, 
a book of gospel trivia. I called everybody I knew in the professional gospel music, and that was several at the time. I traced down leads literally from Florida to New Jersey to Connecticut, all the way to California, Texas. There was no such book to be had. There were a number of scholarly works that were out there uh, that, um, you know, were histories and whatnot of different groups and of the, the music in general, but no gospel trivia. Thus started a three-year research and writing program for me to produce gospel trivia. I put it together uh, with radio stations in mind because I had listened to a lot of gospel music stations over the years and got so annoyed at uh, DJs who every time they opened their mouth showed their ignorance of the groups and the music that they were playing. Obviously, these were not professionals as such, but it, it annoyed me. So I put it together with that in mind, but also for the fans. I wanted it to be not simply a history, but something that um, people could enjoy. And uh, it thrilled me over the years uh, Paul Heil, in particular, and his wife, Paul Heil of Gospel Greats, uh, I had uh, actually sent him a manuscript before I, I published the book, and I saw him, he and his wife, later at the uh, National Quartet Convention, and he said, Phil, it's great. He said, we're getting all our friends together, and we're playing gospel trivia. <laughs> I've, coming from Paul Heil, that was a a real plus to me. And so uh, anyway, thus, as I said, uh, that's, that is the, the um, genesis of the book, Gospel Trivia. And that's what this, this is all about right now. I want to tell you, gospel music, as we think of it today, has a very long history. Gospel music as an expression of praise is certainly nothing new. Throughout history, God's people have used music and singing to glorify the name of the Lord. In fact, the first recorded reference to gospel music actually goes back about 4,000 years. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Pharaoh followed and would have recaptured them. But God miraculously parted the Red Sea allowing his people to pass through on dry land. The Pharaoh and his armies tried to follow, but all were drowned. Thus, Moses taught the people a new song of praise to the Lord. Exodus 15, 1, 21. Gospel Music's First Outdoor Concert The roots of Southern Gospel Music may not go back 4,000 years, but they can certainly be traced back at least 100 years to the post-Civil War South, and to the spread of shape notes. The South's first normal singing school for the purpose of teaching teachers was started by the Rubush Kiefer Company at New Market, Virginia in 1874. The idea behind shape notes is simple. The notes are written using seven different shapes, circle, triangle, etc., corresponding to the seven different sounds within an octave of music. If a person is able to learn sound associated with each shape, he can then read the music. In 1903, James D. Vaughn, a singing school teacher and composer, had settled in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, and had begun the James D. Vaughn Music Company. Vaughn, considered by many to be the father of modern gospel music, invented the Gospel Quartet about 1912 to help him publicize the songbooks his company was publishing. Since the songbooks were written in four-part harmony, the quartets could travel to churches, schools, and communities everywhere and sing the song straight from the books. They could also teach the song to the people and, most important of all, sell the songbooks. 
The idea was tremendously successful. The James D. Vaughan Company eventually published 105 different songbooks, each selling an average of 117,000 copies. In 1926, one of Vaughan's editors, V.O. Stamps, joined with J.R. Baxter, Jr. to form the Stamps Baxter Music and Publishing Company. This company was to continue to influence gospel music throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and even into the 1950s by way of the Stamps Baxter School of Music, headquartered in Dallas, Texas. During the years, such gospel greats as James Blackwood, Glenn Payne, George Yance, and the Spears have attended the Stamps Baxter School of Music. After a lapse of some three decades, the school was reopened in 1987 in Nashville, Tennessee. Although James D. Vaughn receives credit for having invented the Gospel Quartet in 1912, the form was not completed until 1927 when Frank Stamps, brother to James D. Stamps, hired Dwight Brock as a piano player for the Frank Stamps all-Star Quartet. Until this time, the piano player had always doubled as one of the singers. By hiring Brock, a brother to the late Lena Mom Spear, Stamps freed up his singers and gave us the first modern-day quartet made up of four singers and an accompanist. During these early years, it was thought by most in the gospel music business that you had to have an all-male quartet to succeed. There were, however, two notable exceptions that proved this theory wrong. One was the Spear family, which started in 1921 with Tom and Lena, dad and mom Spear, along with Tom's sister and brother-in-law, Pearl and Logan Claiborne. The other exception of note was the Lefevers. The Lefevers also got their start in 1921 with Urias, Alphys, and their sister Maud. In 1934, when Maud left the group, Urias' wife, Eva May, joined the group. The Lefevers continued to sing under the family name for over 50 years. When Eva May retired, the group's bass singer took over as owner of the group, and the group became known as the Rex Neeland Singers. Today, the group is simply known as the Neelands. The 1930s and 40s were a time of great change, both in the nation and in gospel music. It was during these years that Southern gospel music really began to take shape. In 1934, at Ackerman, Mississippi, three brothers, Roy, Doyle, and James, sons of a Mississippi sharecropper and his wife, along with Roy's young son, R.W., formed the now legendary Blackwood Brothers Quartet. For the first few years, the only accompaniment the group used was one of the brothers playing guitar. Then in 1939, the Blackwood brothers became affiliated with V.O. Stamps, who added Joe Roper to the group as piano player. Truly, the rest was to become gospel music history. The Blackwood brothers' influences spanned several decades. During this period of the 1930s and 40s, the nation was going through a depression and a world war. Gospel music was still in its infancy, but most groups found it impossible to make a living singing only gospel songs. Groups frequently sang a variety of gospel, pop, and western songs of the day. A good example was the Sunshine Boys of Florida. J.D. Sumner began his professional career with the Sunshine Boys during the late 1940s. At the time J.D. joined, the group consisted of Ace Richmond, Eddie Wallace, and Fred Daniels. The Sunshine Boys were famous for combining Western music along with gospel music at their concerts. The group was highly successful, recording over 800 songs and appearing in 19 Western movies for PRC and Columbia Pictures. The Oak Ridge Boys, popular country music of today, were once considered to be among the very best in gospel music. During their peak years, 1969 to 1974, the Oak Ridge Boys received 12 Dove Awards for their excellence in the gospel field. Like the Sunshine Boys, the Oak Ridge Boys didn't always sing only gospel music. The group started in 1945 under the name of Wally Fowler and his Georgia Clodhoppers. And, as the name implies, 
the group sang country as well as gospel songs. Soon the group took on the name Oak Ridge Boys after the Oak Ridge Nuclear Research Center at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were appearing at the time. Singers were not the only ones forced to combine other forms of music with gospel in order to put food on the table. Leroy Abernathy, one of gospel music's most respected songwriters and teachers, also found this to be true. Leroy has written hundreds of wonderful gospel songs, which are likely to still be as fresh and as new generation from now as they were the day he penned them. Songs like Miracles Will Happen on That Day, Termites in the Temple, Moving Up to Glory Land, and his most famous Wonderful Time Up There are still being recorded today. But not all of Leroy's songs have been purely gospel in nature. In 1936, when Franklin Roosevelt ran for his second term as President of the United States, his campaign song was Good Times Are Coming Soon, written by Leroy Abernathy. Today, some people look back on the early days of gospel music with dismay, even contempt. Groups back then, I've heard some say, were more interested in entertainment than ministry. In some cases, no doubt, that was true. In some cases, it still is. One very important point I wish to make is that today's gospel music is what it is because of the blending of different styles during those early years. Everything was new back then. The groups learned from each other. Many times a concert might include gospel groups, country, western, even blues and jazz combos, all on the same stage. The gospel groups learned from the others, and perhaps even more important, people who might not otherwise come in contact with the gospel message heard it proclaimed in song. As the decade of the 1940s closed out, another legendary gospel quartet was formed. In 1948, Hovey Lister from Poe Mill, South Carolina, now part of Greenville, put together the Statesman Quartet. The Statesman Quartet of Atlanta, Georgia, and the Blackwood Brothers, who moved to Memphis, Tennessee, in August of 1950, were to be the two dominant gospel quartets of the 1950s. The list of firsts of these two groups is phenomenal. To begin with, the Statesmen were the first gospel quartet to use a full orchestra for background rather than simply a piano. Hovey Lister hired the Wade Krieger Orchestra of Atlanta to play for the group on the famous Nabisco shows of the 1950s. These 15-minute television programs were the first syndicated gospel music television shows to have a national sponsor. The Statesman broke new ground for gospel music by appearing on popular non-gospel television programs such as the Jimmy Dean Show, the Tennessee Ernie Ford Show, and Dave Garraway's Wide World. The group's vocals were also included on two major motion pictures, God is My Partner, and a man called Peter. During the 1950s, Herman Talmadge, governor of the state of Georgia, officially declared the statesmen as ambassadors of goodwill for the state. Thanks in great part to the efforts of the statesman quartet, gospel music drew more people to the auditoriums of Atlanta during the 1950s than did symphony concerts, basketball tournaments, jazz, ballet, wrestling, or any other form of entertainment. It was not all smooth sailing for the statesmen, however. Like all other innovators, they had their detractors. Warren Roberts, host of the number one gospel radio program in their hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, condemned the group for their use of modern harmonies. In fact, Roberts actually broke a recording of Head and Home on the air, vowing never to play it again. Those same modern harmonies of, of the 1950s are commonplace today. The second giant group of the 1950s, as mentioned earlier, was the Blackwood Brothers Quartet. To detail the lives and contributions of the Blackwoods would take a book. For the sake of those interested in more details than I am able to offer here, let me suggest, above all, the fascinating and true story of the lives and careers of the famous Blackwood Brothers Quartet by Cree Jackson Racine and the James Blackwood story by James Blackwood with Don Martin. 
The Blackwood brothers were the first to use four microphones on stage instead of one or two, allowing each singer more freedom of movement on the stage. They were the first to use a private airplane to fly to concerts, but this practice came to a tragic halt in 1954 when a plane crash killed R.W. Blackwood and Bill Lyles, along with an 18-year-old passenger. The Blackwoods were the first to use a customized bus for travel, and the list goes on. Perhaps their greatest gift to gospel music, and its fans, was the National Quartet Convention. This was the brainchild of J.D. Sumner, who was by this time singing bass for the Blackwoods. The Blackwood Brothers Quartet put up the financial support, and J.D. managed the convention for several years. The first convention was held in Memphis, Tennessee in 1956. The decade of the 1960s brought new groups with new excitement to the forefront of gospel music. By the mid and late 1960s, perhaps the most popular groups in gospel were the regulars on the Gospel Singing Jubilee television program. The Florida Boys Quartet, the Happy Goodman Family, the Dixie Echoes, and the Inspirations became instantly recognizable to gospel fans nationwide, and the show highlighted gospel soloists and groups from every part of the country. In its heyday, the Jubilee was seen in every major television market in the United States. This was a tremendous boost to gospel music, exposing new people to Southern gospel, many of whom had never heard it before. Before this, gospel music was heard only rarely on television. In fact, gospel music was not heard even on radio in the same way it is today. All gospel radio stations were few and far between in the early years. Many country music stations played segments of gospel music, usually in the early morning or at noon. Otherwise, gospel music was generally considered Sunday music. During the late 1960s and 70s, new doors began to open for gospel music. The Gospel Music Association, the GMA, was formed to promote and recognize quality in gospel music. In 1969, J.G. Whitfield, who had been responsible for forming the Florida Boys Quartet and later the Dixie Echoes, added another page to his resume of accomplishments, starting with a mailing list of 90,000 gospel music fans compiled from his years as a gospel singer and promoter, Whitfield, along with Jerry Kirksey, began a newsletter for gospel music. The Singing News is today premier gospel music magazine in the country. Gospel music seemed to come of age during this period. The Florida Boys headed up a troop of singers who went to Israel to perform, the first such tour of Israel by Southern Gospel groups. Groups like the Florida Boys, Wendy Bagwell and the Sunlighters, and others began to appear at Carnegie Hall in New York. Gospel groups toured in Europe and even entertained our troops in Vietnam. The 1980s saw even more advancement for gospel music. Many of the old names were still around. People like the Spears, the Chuck Wagon Gang, and the Florida Boys with their 60-plus years, 50-plus years, and 40-plus years, respectively. Southern gospel groups, old and new, as well as promoters and fans, pulled together more during the 80s than ever before. The Southern Gospel Music Guild was formed in order to help in the effort. All of these efforts were paying off. Gospel music is more popular now than ever before. Southern Gospel groups tour from coast to coast and even into Canada. New groups, as well as soloists, are gaining national attention almost every day. Today, more than 1,800 radio stations throughout the country play at least some gospel music each week. There are more all-gospel radio stations than ever before. More chances to get quality gospel music on television and more record companies to help produce and market gospel music than ever before in history. As the 1980s closed out, it was only fitting that the 1989 National Quartet Convention was the biggest ever, and it certainly was. For the first time since the convention was moved to Nashville, Tennessee in 1971, both Friday night and Saturday night were sold out completely. 
Nearly 10,000 people crowded into the municipal auditorium in downtown Nashville each night to hear their favorite gospel groups. We look back with pride in the accomplishments of all those who came before, but we also look forward with renewed vigor and expectations, knowing that the true golden age of gospel music is not in the past, but in the future. We hope you have enjoyed this first installment of Radio Remembers Southern Gospel Music. Over the next several episodes, historian, author, and longtime radio man Phil Womack will be highlighting some of the individuals and groups that laid the foundations for what is now modern Southern Gospel Music. Not only will he share excerpts from his book, Gospel Trivia, A Guide to Southern Music, but also stories and anecdotes taken from his personal knowledge and friendship with many of these legendary performers, as well as select musical performances by some of the groups themselves. Be with us next time as, once again, Radio Remembers Southern Gospel Music.